should be uh, a senior role uh, with allocated staff resources. Duties should be made clear. The knowledge, skills, and experience um, that people need to do the job should be specified, and promotion routes within the profession should be available. Um, I, I made a comment earlier about um, a way of thinking about the profession over my working life has been from the back room to the boardroom. Uh, in some countries, um, working on records is a disciplinary uh, penalty, um, a formal disciplinary penalty, short of you know, having your wages docked or um, losing seniority, being sent to work in the records office. Now, what does that say about how information management is valued in that sort of environment? We need to value it. People need to see that this is a career which people could move on in and uh, which they will be valued in. Resources include um, space for um, holding of material, facilities necessary to hold digital material, system support to maintain it and to develop it over time, and the investment which recognizes that uh, and I think most people do now, although it took quite a while for them to realize it, um, buying the system, whatever the system is, is only the start of your spending and maintain, maintaining systems over time, you know, upgrades, migrating from system to system, all need to be planned for, even if it's unclear at this stage exactly how and when that will be done. It needs to be recognized as a valid and appropriate cost. In terms of systems, people, there are many organizations still using paper-based systems, and there is nothing wrong with that if that meets their needs. Increasingly, people have moved to digital systems, which have allowed them to do lots of things which a paper-based system simply can't do for them. But most organizations, I guess, run a hybrid of the two. Whatever the system is, we need to be sure that it's got adequate security. And learning and development, needs to be at all levels from general awareness uh, for all staff may be included in induction training to specialist skills for information management staff and just as we have right now continuing professional development for professional staff and when we think about monitoring measurement and evaluation then we need to think about how efficient economic and effective the current system is we need to constantly have our processes under review to identify problems and address weaknesses. And we need to have the usual sorts of things of key performance indicators, service level agreements, performance standards and measures. And one of the positives of our area of work is more than others, it can be easier to measure. And that can be a powerful tool to demonstrate the need for change um, or to demonstrate the effectiveness of change after it's been made. I've included these two quotes because it's tempting at a time like this to think everything is so awful that, um, you know, let's just focus on getting through from day to day and we'll worry about improving things when we uh, get to a better place. Well, whenever that better place is, and what is going to be, I would urge you to think about taking advantage of the current period to enhance systems and work towards information enrichment. And the two quotes um, uh, I would commend to you, when you have that window of opportunity called a crisis, move as quickly as you can, get as much done as you can. There's a momentum for change that's very compelling. And that momentum for change is something that one shouldn't underestimate as perhaps the key element of successful change management um, compared to unsuccessful change plans. And um, Albert Einstein said, in the midst of every crisis lies an opportunity. And I think that recognizing that even though things are incredibly difficult at the moment, there is an opportunity for us to promote our profession and to move it forward. So 
I would encourage you to think about grasping that opportunity. And one of the first questions that I always ask organizations um, to think about is, do you have adequate control over your information to support ongoing activities and to provide accountability? Uh, and the answer for almost every organization is, well, mm, pretty much, yeah, 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 almost. Um, yeah, we're 90% there. Think about what those words mean. What kind of control is in place at the moment? What ongoing activities are being carried on that require the support of information? And is that information supporting those activities? And what legal and regulatory requirements do you need to meet? Which, uh, and are you gathering the information which it will enable you to do so? So what can you do? Well, the best starting point is quite simply to know what information you've got in the organization. Uh, and if that sounds simplistic, I make no apologies for it. This really is where we need to start and where most organizations will have a challenge. We need to know where that information is and where it should be, who can access it and who should be able to access it, how long it takes to retrieve, how reliable it is. And then once we know the answer to those questions, we need to ask ourselves, what do we actually need? Most organizations have far more information assets than they ever need to do those two functions of supporting ongoing activities and achieving accountability. You need to identify what information you actually need, and then you need to value it. So a good starting point as well is ensuring that existing policies and procedures are being implemented. Um, particularly if you're a consultant, and I speak as someone who's worked as a consultant for the past 30 odd years, um, the temptation is to ignore what already exists and say, right, let's create something new. Let's, let's, you know, let's be totally up to date. A good starting point is look at the existing policies and procedures and see if they're being implemented. Because if they're not, then you don't have the basis on which to start with something new. Look at the existing policies and procedures, look at how well they're being implemented, and then identify which of those need to change. And I think we need to be always, as professionals, advocating for improvements and leading by example. And uh, where can we get help to do that? Well, again, the good news is there's a great deal of help around. Um, there are, is learning and development. There are a whole range of courses. You know, um, these are from the happy days of uh, when we could all get together and do things. But um, there are lots and lots of online courses. There's excellent consultancy and advice organizations. Um, and uh, here I have an image of our good friends at VirtuSync Limited. Uh, with whom we do a range of work, but we work with a range of other organizations and in our own right, there are lots of consultancy and advice sources. There are professional associations like our own uh, excellent um, institute. And I've also included there the Information and Records Management Society, but there are many, many others around the world. And we're also blessed with lots and lots of free resources. Um, I've highlighted their three um, sources, the UK National Archives, the International Records Management Trust, massive education and training packages, um, and um, the best practice guidelines from the uh, UK archives. These are just the first three that came to my mind. Um, there are many, many others, the US uh, National Archives, um, the Australian archives, Canadians, all put out very, very good stuff. Um, there is no shortage of free resources. And um, having said that I work as a consultant at the risk of, you know, damaging my own professional um, opportunities, I would say always start with the free resources. 
um, uh, before you start looking to paying for professional advice. Okay, so there we are. That was a very quick run through because I want us to be discussing things rather than um, this being a one way uh, lecture. So I'm going to stop at that point and to invite any questions or thoughts that we can discuss and share. So thank you for your patience and attention in listening to that. Uh, and I'm happy to develop on anything that I've said or to explain anything which might seem a bit odd or um, you'd like me to clarify. So at that point, uh, Mr. Nago, I'll pause and um, hand back to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Neil Macon. That has been a very good uh, masterpiece and presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, the audience, like I instructed, if you have any questions, you put up the questions on the chat box. If you have any questions to, for Neil or you need any clarifications, we can uh, take that. Uh, while we wait for the questions, uh, just to notify you, we have um, our own pool questions that we're going to I'll be asking you, the audience. So based on that, uh, that would need would bring in more insight from the presentations that Neil had just made. So. You know, I used to say, Neil, when, when there are no questions in a uh, presentation that means the, the deliveries were digested uh, it was very clear and it's opened up the mind of persons so it happens right i okay. think we have um, someone we're, we're having comments and uh, okay. professor Rotin is raising his hand okay um, i think he needs to have used uh, the chat box so um neil the questions are coming up some good comments coming all right, so we have a question from DG Hamzi, right? How can one determine reliability of resource materials obtained from open source? Where well, this is just, uh, Lee, you want to take that question? Um, there's a lot of open source materials out there that is reliable. Determine reliability is the information that is there, the source. Um, Absolutely. Well, I, I think the key thing is to look at what the source is. Um, the ones which I have uh, mentioned, two are from a national um, government agency. Uh, the other is from a highly regarded non-government agency. But um, I would be very wary, very wary about things from commercial organizations. Um, and... Uh, I think this is an excellent question, and I'm really grateful you've given the opportunity, me the opportunity to say this. Um, things which come from, which are free from commercial organizations are usually very good, but have an agenda. And the agenda most commonly is trying to sell you something uh, or to um, convince you that a certain way of thinking about things um, which relates to the thing which they're selling um, will be in your best interest. So I would always go, uh, your starting point, I think, should be government agencies, um, academic institutions, uh, and professional associations. Uh, open source material beyond that, I would be wary of. And to be honest, I don't think you'll need it. I think there's plenty in the um, pub, the open public sector of academic, you know, universities, um, government departments, national archives, and professional associations um, to to meet most of our needs. So, excellent question, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to mention that. Right. Um, thank you, Neil. We have another question from. Yeah, I think what he's trying to talk about is how do you put your proof? Is so fine. Um, Neil, you talked about the source is very important of the information you get. Now, um, another one from Professor Rotimi, um, JSME, he says, How do we ensure connectivity between systems when building a new information management system? Very good question. 
Yeah, it is uh, an excellent question. Yeah. And the, the follow on bit about um, how do you future proof it? Um, if any of us knew the answer to that, uh, we <laughs> would be very, 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 very rich people. <laughs> um, what you have to do is uh, to recognize now, this is uh, uh, the answer is I, I mean, one answer to the question, the quick answer to the question is I don't know. Um, the way to approach this, I think, is to say that your information management needs, as opposed to your um, systems needs, uh, your, your mani information needs don't change very quickly. The technology, the communication technology changes all the time. And the storage um, technology also changes, but on a slower, um, slower uh, time scale. So um, you cannot ensure connectivity between systems in the future because you simply do not know, and none of us know um, what is going to exist. I mean, who would have thought, I don't know, what, 10 years ago, that WhatsApp would be such a dominant communication uh, methodology? I don't think anybody, really. We have no idea what the next thing is. But what we can do is to be very clear about what our information management needs are. And this relates back to what is the information we need to hold? Who needs to access it? How long do we need to keep it? And then the technology follows on from that. Now, that might sound a bit as though I'm oversimplifying it. I hope it doesn't sound like that because I think that is the key. And so often we get too focused on the technology part, the machinery part of any new system and not enough on the process part. The process is don't change very rapidly. The technology is changing all the time and you'll never get ahead of the technology but your information needs and processes do not change at the same speed. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about that if that seemed like an inadequate answer, but I'm, uh, it's an excellent question. And, and I, I'm, as I say, I'm more than happy to return to that if, if that would help. Okay, um, uh, then we have another question, okay. Um, I don't know, Neil, if you can see the question on your chat box as well, so I don't need to have to read it out. Uh, well, I'm cheating, really. I'm going to let you read it because it gives All me longer right. to think about it. So. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Okay, so how do you resolve a situation where an organization prefer quickness to information reach when making business decisions? That's absolutely fine. That's no problem at all. Um, the, uh, speed is great. We like quickness. Um, remember that that initial statement was the right information to the right person at the right time. time yeah. um, most organizations can find the information they need, but finding it in time is the big challenge. Quickness can be your ally in making the case for better systems. And if that's what the organization focuses on, don't bother talking about information enrichment. Talk about you know rapid information flow or you know, speedy information inputs or whatever it is that people are going to recognize and value in your organization. I don't think that's a problem. And in fact, if I was working with an organization which said that to me, I would be very pleased to engage with that conversation. Um, I think it would be, a, I, if it were me, I would engage, I would encourage the organization to recognize that the assumption in quickness is the information still has quality. No organization um, must want quick information that is totally unreliable. So the system needs to be uh, improved to develop, you know, to, to meet their need for speedy information, but of an adequate quality, i.e. the information needs to be correct.
So yeah, I'd be happy to engage with that organization and that conversation. And I would it, exploit sounds like a negative word, but I would leap upon that word of quickness and make that my focus of talking with them about how we can improve the system to achieve that objective. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Neil. Uh, we have, how can inf information be eternally protected slash preserved in the digital age? Uh, right, excellent question again. Um, I'm going to take issue with you about the word eternally because the vast right. amount of information won't need to be kept eternally. Yeah. It will need to be kept for a limited period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to waste money um, keeping things you don't need for a long time. So forgive me if, if uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm picking on that. It's a really important question. And it's one of the things that people fail to recognize. I used the story about the space agency um, and its loss of, of organizational memory. People used to think, well, we can keep everything forever because we used to have to pay for shelves and boxes and warehouses and record centers. Now we can just keep it you know, up in the cloud and you can keep vast amounts forever, but you can't. You have to migrate it across systems. You have to protect it. And that is what you need. That's why you need to focus on what information do we really need and how long do we really need it for? And then have um, people used to call it, I don't know if they still do, used to call it an active records management policy, i.e. a policy of having identified the key information, migrating that information from system to system over time. You don't want to be doing that with all the information that you've got. So narrow down the amount of information you need to do it for and then have a policy uh, which is kept to of preserving it by migration from system to system over time. Hello, Neil, are you there? I am indeed. Okay, so um, Ani, I think me, you talked about only the eternal. Okay, you try to clarify the eternally, right? So is, is that I talking about how you can yeah. eternally protect, protect or preserve it? So you're talking about protecting it in the digital age, right? You know, now we're in digital transformation. There will be a lot of investment. Remember, it's part of what you mentioned, right? A lot of investments yeah. that go into the digital age, there will be need for more storage capabilities to be able to preserve those um, informations that are of value okay so you you actually had um, clarified eternally protected so he is interested to know how it has to be protected in the digital age right yes. remember you made you mentioned digital yes. you mentioned physical you mentioned hybrid okay yes so that is going back to that point of the slide and recently i remember i'm the president is here i'm actually doing a research on how we can protect the information in digital age, having uh, what we have physically to have what we call the digital archiving using blockchain. That was actually a research I'm doing currently. So this comes in line with what is asking fully. This is a very yes. good question. Yeah. Oh, it's an extremely good question. And um, I mean, the, 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 the shortest answer is migrate from system to system over time. But that, is ex that will become increasingly expensive. So the key thing is to ensure that you're only doing that for information which really does need warrant that that cost. And um, it is doable uh, and it will become easier and easier as uh, this becomes a bigger and more important challenge for more and more countries and organizations. Um, and as with all technological challenges, it will become easier and it will become second nature to us. But right now, the key thing is to ensure that, you know, as you upgrade your systems, you are moving your information from one system to another, the stuff which has to be preserved. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and um, I hope Dr. Kofu, you've gotten uh, some answers. For any further thing, we have a lot of um, things we can put across. Now we have a question from Amina Deji that says, She's trying to be sure if we talked about the topic on risk assessment was covered in the process of information and real decision making. Uh, um, 
I'm well, I know, probably not really. And so thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about it. All information management is about risk assessment, really. The risk of um, keeping the information as opposed to disposing of it, the risk of making it available as opposed to um, um, inappropriate access. Um, it, it is an area which I personally find very interesting and I find actually fairly easy in that once you start categorizing the information that you have, um, in particularly in terms of how long you need to keep it and the security levels which need to be applied to it, then that's all a process of risk assessment really. Um, risk assessment and cost assessment are the two things that you need to balance there. Um, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions about that. But yeah, risk assessment, all of records management, all of information management, it, it involves risk assessment because you're constantly making judgments about what do I keep? How long do I keep it for? Where do I keep it? Who do I allow access to it? What security protocols do I need to put around it? Perfect news. That was, that was strict. All right. So we have another one that says, how do we ensure we are actually having the single version of the truth in an organization? Well, that's, ex that, that's our job. That's our job. It's a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, it is a challenge because um, we have lost centralized control of the organization's information. Um, if you take uh, the sort of classic image of a traditional registry in, let's say, a government department, okay, um, they hold all the paper files, letters come in, they get put onto a file, and they get sent to an action officer. The action officer prepares a response, um, and that response is, a copy of that response is put onto the file. So um, each file is about a particular subject and it's really, really easy to see um, what the single version of that truth is. Uh, it's all in one place on one file. Now we've lost control of that decades ago, really. And um, the real starting point is to be clear about what an organizational information resource is. Everybody in the organizations needs to understand what they have to copy to a centralized system or what they have to use organizational um, resources to communicate about. Uh, thank goodness there are, there are less every year, but there are still a large number of people who are communicating um, official uh, matters on WhatsApp uh, or from Gmail accounts and not organizational accounts. So the organization has to take some, some uh, discipline, impose some discipline about uh, what people can communicate about and how they should do it. Um, people don't like this. It, it's, it's human nature not to want to do this. But the organization has to own its information if it's ever to get anywhere near to having a single version of the truth. So the starting point is the organization owning its information by saying to its employees and staff and contractors, this is organizational information which must be retained within the organization, whether that's by copying a central point in, or whether that's by using official communication channels, um, that's up to the organization to decide and for people like us to advise them on it. But that's the starting point. Okay. Okay, just all about what you said, you need to know what you have and how to, how to communicate it, the various channels of communication. Okay, uh, thank you, Neil. And uh, we have the last, one here before we call up the pools to the participants. 
Um, how safe is cloud storage for confidential documents? Oh, goodness me, it depends who you ask, really. Um, I, I think it's important. Um, well, it depends what type of confidentiality and confidentiality is something that the concept of what is confidential and what confidential means differs from organization to organization and from country to country. Um, there are some organizations which mark almost everything as confidential. Uh, if we're talking about stuff which really needs to be preserved, then I think you have to be very, you, you need to investigate exactly what your cloud storage, what cloud storage means for your organization. And for really critical um, material, highly sensitive material, um, it's a personal choice, but I would not trust cloud storage. I mean, if Let's imagine a piece of information. Uh, okay, I'm going to get carried away now, so forgive me. But let's imagine I've gone into um, a witness protection program. And so I've been given a whole new identity uh, and a new life. And if people find out that I'm really Neil McCallum, then I will get killed. I'm not sure I would want the information about my new identity to be held in cloud storage. Now, maybe I'm just being very old fashioned and very negative, but I think to err on the side of caution is a sensible approach. So I would look at what assurances you can have about cloud storage, look at what, you know, how confidential this information really is uh, and how significant the information really is, and then make a, a very conservative, a very cautious decision about it, okay? Okay, Neil, thanks a lot for that. Um, just a lot of time. Uh, we don't want to delve into it's a very good question regarding cloud storage commission documents, right? Mm. There, is, there, are, there are going to be regulatory issues there was, because the issue of data sovereignty and regulatory concerns, why you need to do that. So you need to know what are, what are the regulatory concerns for each of your country, if it's allowed to do that. Yeah. And as a business, what your policy says, your strategy does it allow that? It's not advisable to save commercial data in cloud storage, depending on where the cloud storage is residing. Uh, like you said, looking at security trust, assurance, and risks. If the provider can give you that, then you are, you are willing to do that. But again, we have to be careful. We don't do don't put commercial documents on the public cloud. It's not advisable. If you're going to do that, you have to ensure you, you own the encryption of the data on the cloud yeah. of the information. Okay, absolutely so, right. Absolutely. So we have uh, another question. How do we align the University of Information Management concepts definition with global acceptance? <laughs> Dr. Marvin, I like this question. Right. Gosh, right. That's a okay. That sounds like almost it could be. Uh, the basis for a PhD, actually. Uh, exactly, that's yes. a, that's yes. deep. That's deep. Very uh, deep. I, 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 whew, let me think about this. Um, <laughs> this is the second time I've seen this question. Well, I hope the first person made a better, <laughs> better job of answering it than I prob I am probably going to, but let oh. me try. Not in this webinar. Told you, it was that it was in the MIT CDO event, uh, online event symposium. All oh, right, 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 <laughs> yes. right. Yes. Um. Well, we can't do this now, but exactly. if we could, I would, I would like to challenge you on whether most concept definitions that relate to information management are concepts in disarray. I'm not sure. I wholly um accept your starting point now uh, i'm i'm willing to be convinced and uh, i would probably you know i would enjoy the opportunity of of debating it but i'm not sure they are and my personal approach is i distrust um making information management too complex the technology is breathtakingly complex. The concepts, I think, are pretty straightforward. 
And so I think this is a conversation for another day, but it would yeah. be an excellent I mean, thing to debate because I don't, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced. I, I agree with the starting point, but maybe we can have the opportunity one day to debate it. I would enjoy that very much. Okay, thank you so much, Neil. That was a very good uh, response. Um, Dr. Marvin, uh, it's a good debate, really. And uh, it's a good debate. It's, it has been there. But we're outside this webinar. We will have that because it's a lot of research uh, discussions that has been going on for years. But that, that for me, there are no disarray, really. But it's just conceptions. So um, Dr. Edioku, I think we have to take that out and take go that by looking at it. Um, Mr. President, are you there? Sure, sure, I'm listening. Okay. All right, sir. Um, so uh, without any further questions, we have a That's pool for... Case. Okay, sir. Uh, looking forward to the debate in Duke. Yeah, Dr. Marvin, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> we, we are here for you, no problem, Dr. Marvin. All right, so um, we have a pool for the audience, so it doesn't take much of our time. Uh, we have to publish a pool for us to, okay, has the pool be published? Wow. Sorry, what's going on? I think it should, I think it should be up now. Okay. All right, please, can everyone see the pool? If you can see, just indicate yes on the chat box, please. Indicate yes or raise your hand. Raise your hands up. So we just have two questions. All right, that's fine. I'm in a, I'm in a DG. So we have to answer the questions. Uh, we have uh, two questions. Okay, uh, it will no problem. We will publish the results and uh, we'll have Neil look at it. We're still waiting for orders to complete. Okay, thank you for the notification, Emmanuel. Still have it to get up to. We have 17 persons so far attended to the pool, so we have 30, we have 34 active persons. We have to exclude, we have 30 active persons. So we have 21 persons so far. We still have um, seven more persons. We are just on five percent to go. Seven more persons to attend to the pool before we can end uh, the pool. Okay, perhaps six more persons to go. 
Is it time? So we're out of time. Now. Okay, so you have 15 minutes more to go. 14 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so. Um, Okay, um, uh, Doctor, we have to end the pool. Okay. So we can publish the results. We have, oh, one second. We see how many people are turning to it. Okay. Still have four minutes left. Please, I will encourage everyone to attend the pool. Oh, have 24. Now, four minutes left. Okay, I think uh, not to waste much of our time. Uh, this is already past it. So, please yeah, go ahead and end the poll so we can publish the results. Okay, share results. Okay. Um, Mr. Neil, are you there? Yep. Okay, so we have the multiple choice. Can you see the results? The I results? can indeed. Yes, thank you. Okay, perfectly. All right, you can see from what we've been talking about in the summary, we have two major questions, right? That has multiple choice uh, for the audio participants. So the first one was what detects the value of records in aiding retention? We have Eight person says societal value, right? Cultural value, no one, nobody said anything there. Regulatory value, fifty nine percent. All of the above, objective value for all of the above had seventy one percent. So, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I think my view would have been um, all of the above, really. Um, oh, sure. I think it's key issue, I and mean, everything starts off having, well, virtually everything starts off having administrative or regulatory value. They tend to be the shortest lived values because um, for many, many records and information uh, sets, uh, they have limited life. Items of um, societal value or cultural historic value tend to have you know, very, very long lives. And if you take the example of the Doomsday Book I showed you, um, there is a document which has no um, regulatory or administrative value whatsoever, but has massive cultural and historic value. So it, I think the answer I would give is all of the above, really, as, as the vast majority of you did. Yes, that's correct, because um... The, the or A to D, the four options is what it thinks the value of record, but it depends on retention value set for each of it based on there. All right, so number two, what is the biggest barrier facing your organization today? Uh, a lot of people, the question they asked today on the chat box is in line with this. Someone talks about the quickness, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you have the money, you go quick, right? If you don't have the money, you become the, the follower based on your enterprise strategy. If you are if you are the if you are the first, we call it um, the follower. We have the the slow adopters, the first adopters. So here we have senior management commitment twenty five percent. Interesting. Lack of adherence to existing policies. Uh, Ni nee, had mentioned this. Lack of professionalism amongst information managers. Two percent you mentioned about learning and development, which is very key, it's a continuous process. Technological barriers 29 percent. Interesting, it's extremely interesting. I'm, I'm gonna think more about this because, um, there is no clear, you know, there's no one dominant area where most people are focusing, um, and that's really, really helpful, actually. And, and there is a reason why, um we picked these four areas because these are the most common problems organizations face. Um, I suppose, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's very interesting. 
I'm, I'm pleased that senior management commitment is the lowest um, because that's the biggest single barrier. Um, if you have senior management behind you, most other things can be solved, yeah. really. And when I think of you know, the projects that I've been involved in, when senior management are behind it, things move very easily. So yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, that's good. Uh, like uh, we're going to have this publishing detail. Yes, because when there's lack of senior management commitment, nothing's going to happen. You can't go ahead. But most times you can have senior management commitment. But when you talk about monitoring, measurement, and evaluation, if you don't build the skills and the competencies of the people, even when there's management commitment, you're going to have issues. Again, if you don't have um good uh people that are professional that has the, the knowledge right to build the system then you will develop you will going to implement wrong technologies so that's why it's not the barrier right mm -hmm. but when you if if you have the people if you don't train the people you that that will develop the policies right even when you develop the policies you don't train the people based on what you talked about types of um training you have general awareness you have induction mm -hmm. and other stuff right you will have people that will have lack of adherence to existing policy because you've not trained them. You develop the policy and put it down there, and there's no uh, education, there's no awareness on what they need to do, right? There's no code of conduct or practices they need to follow. So these things happen in the organization. These are key, barriers, but the major one is the first one, but everything follows. So that's why in your slide you had mentioned there should be an effect, if efficiency and effectiveness. Why, why monitoring and measuring of the processes? You have to monitor, measure, and evaluate these things in a consistent manner to ensure that these things meet what top management objectives, because it's very key. So that is um, the summary for this. Thank yeah, you. and so, in addition to that, yes, Mr. Dr. Anago, Sorry, we, can actually, we can also look at it from uh, this other perspective, that is people, process, technology, yes. and, um, you know, all of this that we've been explaining could fall under uh, these um, categories. And um, just like he mentioned, um, having management buying is key to the success uh, in any organization because that will serve as the basis you know, for achieving uh, compliance, um, um, involvement of uh, professionals and other stakeholders, and also ensuring that the resources to ensure that whatever projects um, that is, um, um, whatever current projects or initiative that is going on within the organization is uh, fully uh, funded. So all of this can be achieved when we have the senior management commitment in place. Thank you so much, uh, President. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the audience and uh, our able participant. And thank you so much, uh, Neil, for that great presentation. Um, it has been a very good, you, you kept it simple and straight, and it was very insightful and thoughtful. Um, so I would like to have, um, if we have any of our executive council members here, we can quickly give us some, um, introduce yourselves if you are here. I saw, I think I saw Princess Tuolade here, our VP1. Please, Princess Tuolade, if they're there, please can you introduce yourself. You are there, Tuolade, yeah, please. Um, yes, I wow. think she's, she's online. So yes, I've asked to mute her. Please, uh, Mr. Solari, please, can you go ahead? I've asked to unmute you. Are you with me? Perfectly with you, please. Are you with me, please? Yes, please. please. Um, well, good evening, everyone. I'm actually in transit, but I'm still, you know, okay. flowing very well with you. 
I would like to introduce myself as Princess Mrs. Tiwala de Fakunda, the Vice President one of the Institute. And as usual, my role as the Vice President one is to, to follow, join the President Dr. Ambassador Dr. Yedoku to transform the mission and vision of the Institute into reality through all our various programs and activities. And I also want to thank the our guest lecturer today, Neil. You have done a, you have done justice to this lecture because you took us straight to the point. Very simple, easy to understand. Everybody present here will agree with me that we have learned a lot today and it has increased our knowledge. I would like to also thank you so much. You have done a great job. We are so happy and we are proud of you for a job well done. This is not the first time. In fact, when I saw that you are the one presenting, I said, ah, there is a lot to learn today. And you, you, you have proved me right. And uh, on my own, as I'm here, I salute you and I give you a, a round of applause for this. Thank you so much. And to everybody, the audience, you have highly exciting, friendly, and attentive audience. Thanks for being there. I would also like to thank the President, Dr. Ambassador Dr. Yedoku, for a job well done. We have all gained a lot, being members, fellows, and members of this institute. And it has helped us in our various working careers and working life. And I would like to tell you that our president, you are the best. And by saying the best, I, I mean it from the bottom. I meant it from the bottom of my heart that you are Thank the you, best. I hope you will continue. And I pray that God will continue to renew your strength and give you more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So that Amen. together, we shall all take RIM Institute to the next level. Thank you very much. And for those at the, the crew members, thank you for a job well done. The, thank you so much. My dear great moderator and the MC, uh, my dear brother, <laughs> You have done a very good job introducing, moderating, and doing everything to make this lecture a, 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 a great one. I say thank you, Mr. Anago. You are thank really, you really much. also the best. You are also the best, and I'm proud of you. Thank you very much. And to all our other ESCO members, thank you very much. Governing Council members, thank you so much for being part of this program. So. I say good evening, everyone, and have a refreshing night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we don't have any other um, council member except myself. Uh, my name's uh, Ambassador Alexander M. Dossi Anago, Executive Council Member of Institute Information Management in charge of PR and sponsorship. And I'll have to use this video to thank everyone for a job well done. I appreciate you. And our next webinar will be coming up in January, as usual. And we have our training calendars published on the Institute website for and all our events that will be coming up. And again, I want to personally thank Neil for this. I'm not concluding this because our president has to conclude this. Um, Neil, thank you so much for four, uh, four decades of experience that you have simplified. It looks simple, but it's... For those of us in the profession that understands knows that this is not easy. Um, so without waiting much of our time, uh, Mr. President, please, we need you to make your uh, your comment before we take the group photograph and call it a day. Over to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nago. Um, a very big thank you once again to Nell for um, making our time to be our resource person for uh, the last month in the year 2021. And uh, we hope when next we call on you, you oblige us and um, still come to the platform to share from your wealth of experience. Um, it's been wonderful knowing you and other colleagues over there in the United Kingdom. And I see us doing a lot in the coming year. So my warm regards to your family, most especially your son. Okay. 
uh, please tell him I look forward to meeting him again. And um, on this note, I also want to thank other members of our great institute that are in attendance today. I can see um, Ambassador Dr. Francis Oladele. I can see you're raising your hands up. Um, shortly, I'm going to um, allow you to make your comments. And um, hopefully next year, um, we look forward to introducing better and more interesting topics um, for us to be able to learn from. And um, as we usually do, uh, we will be bringing in resource persons across the globe within the IIM network because we've got best of the best in the industry globally. And you shouldn't expect nothing less in the year 2022. So on that note, I want to allow um, Dr. Ladele, uh, you have the floor, sir. We'd like to hear from you before we proceed to the group photograph session. Uh, you mean Dr. So Francis we... Oladele, right? Yes. Okay, while we wait for him, uh, those of us that are still available online, we can turn on our okay. camera. And Amen. The picture. I thank God for the life of the presenter. That's uh, Dr. Anago, right? Oh, I'm the moderator, sir. Okay. I'm sorry, the man that presented the lecture, but I still have something to contribute. Uh, the question number two. All right. There are times the old management can take wrong decisions that will put them in trouble. Like, uh, that's why I know I don't support the signal management or whatever, whatever they put there. Let's say for granted, somebody they dismissed in the university. At this level, we just, we need, we need to follow the principles of a due process. And the person dismissed can eventually win the battle against the management and they are going to restore him or her. And the man will be compared to pay ransom, big money. So from person management point of view. Also in the bank, don't let me mention my bank where I retired some years ago. We were wrongly dealt with and we sued them. After four years, we were supposed to be, we were supposed to be restated. And they have to pay five years salary for us without doing anything. That's labor law. That's what I want to contribute. There are times what matters most is the information or the professionalism that can help people to move forward. So that of a senior management, I will not support much, maybe because of my profession. God bless you, sir. Thank you, very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I say, because so if, it's not, if, if it's not, I can mislead the whole bank. The whole bank. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis, for that input. Uh, so, uh, Mr. President, I think it's time for group photograph. Uh, I just want to seek um, Mr. Neil, if just one minute. Just 30 seconds, you have something to say. Uh, 30 seconds, just to speak to the participants, to the audience, please. Mr. Neil. Absolutely. Um, I would just like to, I would just like to thank you all uh, for your involvement, some really stimulating questions, and uh, I will be thinking about the points raised for some time to come. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity of being with you, even if it is uh, only virtually, and uh, to wish you uh, safe uh, and positive uh, coming months. I wish you uh, uh, all that you wish yourselves, and I look forward to one day, hopefully, all of us meeting in person. But until then, let us all keep safe and let us 
uh, keep faith with our profession because it is not an easy one and it is not a glamorous one, but it's an incredibly important one. So let us all work together for a, a better world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much. I thank you so much. Uh, Mr. President, please, uh, you ready for the group photograph? Please. Yeah, please. we're waiting for others to turn on their camera. We have uh, 10 seconds to do that. I can see some great backgrounds. I'm a bit ashamed of my background. There's some beautiful <laughs> backgrounds I can see. Uh, so there we go. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, Four, three, two, one, action. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Merry sir. Christmas and Happy New Year in advance. Hope to see you in the new year. Thank you, everyone, and do have a lovely weekend. Good night, Chris.